Hi guys, I'd like to welcome you guys to Lassiter tonight for an event that has truly been years in the making. Um, students at Lassiter who have been in the AP Lang program have had the pleasure of reading essays and stories and poems by Mr. Doyle really since the mid 90s and we're so happy to have been able to get the opportunity to bring him out here to speak with the kids today and, and have this event for you guys tonight. And if you're just really enthralled by what you see, we were happy and fortunate enough to have uh, Charlie and Dalton, our go-to tech guys, uh, manage to get this on our streaming feed at school. So there's even more if you wanna see more. Um, but first I'd like to introduce you guys to Brian Doyle. He is um, a recipient of the American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature. Uh, excuse me, Notre Dame University awarded him the Father Robert Griffin Award for writing. Um, he's been in at least seven editions of the Best American Essays, which is an annual publication. I've read places that he is the most anthologized essayist in that, in that publication. And um, if you ask him, though, to tell you who he is, he would tell you that he's a dad, a dad, a dad, a husband, a son, a father, excuse me, got that one out of, right, of order, uh, a friend and then a writer, last of all. Um, we think that maybe his, his talents uh, are equally strong in all areas. So if you'd join us in welcoming Brian Doyle. Thank you. No pressure there. <laughs> um, well, let me, let, me, let me start the right way. Uh, my mom and dad raised me right. My father's 94, my mother is 93, and uh, my father says it's a May-December romance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, but they taught me, first, before you do anything else, you say thank you. So, you don't know me from a hole in the wall, and I don't know you, and chances are good that a road's not gonna cross much in this lifetime. So before I do anything else, I say thank you. Thank you for your attentiveness, for your witness, for your generosity to me. Thank you for the grace to come out of your house for an evening where you have not the slightest idea what's gonna happen. That seems really brave and foolish to me, but <laughs> did you not have laundry to do? But, <laughs> so, but thank you very much. It seems very gracious of you to come see me, so I'll do my best. Uh, I'll try to make you laugh and maybe I'll make you cry and, uh, and then I'll tell you my story about meeting the Dalai Lama. Remind me to tell you that story. I met the Dalai Lama. We should just start there. <laughs> um, so, uh, also, my nose has been busted three times, twice by my brothers, once by my brother Peter with a two by four. So I have a nasal mutter, sorry. Sometimes I use bad language. It just pops out, sorry. I grew up in New York City and I'm a professional editor. So sometimes I, I use slightly rude words. I don't mean to, so don't be offended. Sometimes I sing, which is really disturbing. Uh, my son Liam says, Dad, when you sing, it sounds like goose farts on a muggy day. <laughs> so. So if that happens, just roll with it. Um, sometimes they make you sing, which is actually pretty cool. And uh, I think we might do that tonight because the sound in here is so exquisite, it seems to me. But first, why don't we just, let's all just relax and uh, let, me, let me tell you some jokes <laughs> just to get relaxed and get out of the whole, you know, I'm wearing my cool black shirt and you're not. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, first, just a story to make you laugh because it just happened to me and I can't, I can't forget it. I was just visiting a fourth grade and uh, I was going on and on and on about miracles and how miracles are everywhere and miracles are pregnant in every moment and if you pay attention, every moment is stuffed and crammed with miracles beyond measure. I know that suffering and grief are part of the package, but there's wonder in front of you all day long if you would just learn to pay attention to it, right? So I'm on my full rant with these kids and then uh, so I finished my rant and up goes a hand, always a girl, and uh, she says, Mr. Boyle, it's like, <laughs> Darn, so much for fame, you know. She goes, Mr. Boyle, I have a question. I said, what? And she goes, you say that miracles are pregnant anywhere. Have you seen any miracles? And you know how you just say stuff right out of your heart without thinking? It's always a mistake, right? Clang, goes your tech filter on the ground, and, and you just say what's in your heart. And, and I said, have I seen miracles? Heck, yes, I've seen miracles. I saw people come out of my wife. There were people living inside my wife. It was disgusting. It was awful. First, the first time it happened, one person came out, feet first. Feet came out of my wife. It was awful. A woman I really like, and there were people living in there. It was like she was in an apartment building. Ugh. It 
it was awful. Every liquid imaginable was there. I was so tired. And, and I suddenly realized, uh-oh, <laughs> what have I done? And I realized they're all nine years old, right? It's fourth grade. And I look up and every single child's looking at me like this. <gasps> oh, the poor teacher, all the blood did drain out of her face, you know. And she says to me later, Mr. Doyle, no offense. You, know, you ever notice when people say no offense, it means I'm about to offend you, <laughs> right? She goes, Mr. Doyle, no offense, but you're the greatest birth control device ever. <laughs> I was like, God, you know. Anyway. Oh, so, uh, and also, let me read you this just for entertainment's sake. When my lovely bride and I, when we were first married, we had a little daughter, right? Our first child's little daughter. Oh, sweet little nuclear family. Wham, twin sons. So we had three kids in diapers, and then my lovely bride's like, I think we should get a dog. I'm like, get a dog? We got enough people peeing on the floor. What's the problem here? <laughs> Did we need somebody else to, you know? So anyway, so it was, it was total chaos and hubbub in our house when, when the kids were little, right? And so, so when the boys were little, my sons were like a year old and you know, starting to move around, and so I pinned this up in the bathroom, and I read this to you for sheer entertainment because it's stupid and silly, that's why. But stupid and silly is not altogether bad. So, rules for small twin boys in the bathroom. Rule number one, point it down! Rule number two, keep pointing it down! Rule number three, dad does all wiping. Rule number four, keep pointing it down even if you're sure you're done. Rule number five, look at me, boys. Look me in the eye. The most important rule of your whole life. Pay attention. Each boy points his own pointer. <laughs> Can I help my brother? No, you cannot help your brother. Keep your hands on your own equipment. <laughs> number six, if spilling occurs, tell dad. Number seven, no washing hands without dad. Number eight, no washing anything without dad. Number nine, no, you cannot pee in the bathtub. Number 10, yes, you can pee in the bushes outside. This is Oregon, for heaven's sake. <laughs> this reminds me when our sons were little, one time I was having a beer with a friend of mine on our lawn, and he stands up and he looks around the corner, there's one car, one car, and he goes, you know, I don't mean to pry into your personal life, but there's a small naked boy trying to mate with your car. <laughs> this was my son Liam who decided he was gonna pee in a gas tank. <laughs> He was only like three years old, you know, and, and he used to run around naked all the time when he was two, three years old. He'd be horrified if I, if I, knowing that I'm telling you this story. And, and so he's running around naked. And so I'm watching this happen, and my friend's like, aren't you going to stop him? And I was like, no, I kind of admire his ambition. <laughs> you know, it's kind of an engineering project, <laughs> it seems to me. So, Number 12, yes, dad has a pointer. Number 13, no, mom does not have a pointer. Number 14, no, I don't know where mom's pointer went. <laughs> Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They tore that down time and time again. Oh, I read this to one of the classes today. When our children are little, somebody said to my lovely bride, do you guys have a video camera? I mean, this is total chaos in your house. I mean, you know, there's people running around. And it, was, it was unbelievable. And, and my wife said, no, no, I don't have a video camera. I have him, because I was going to write down every single thing our kids ever said. Right? That was, my, that was my great ambition. I thought, I'm a writer. I'm a professional. And so, and you know how kids just speak right from their hearts? They have this totally naked, honest, they have no grip on grammar or syntax, and they're totally genuine, right? No, no sarcasm, no cynicism, no snark. They just speak from their hearts, right? So I, I tried to write down everything my kids said for a while. I get, the project was unwieldy, so I finally stopped. But I stumbled across this the other day, so here are some highlights. Things my kids have said that they don't know I know they said. I told Dad I did my homework, but the teacher didn't give us any homework today, so the joke is on Dad. <laughs> huh? <laughs> if you really like Jello and you really like mayonnaise, you should be able to have a Jello and mayonnaise sandwich, and Dad is wrong. <laughs> Dad is not the boss of the family. Mom is the boss of the family. Dad is the boss only of the male. And mom is the boss of everything else. Mom says dad's the boss, but she knows and dad knows that he's only the boss of the male. He's not even the boss of the grass. I'm the boss of the grass. It's like, what does this mean? What? Here's my daughter at age 16. You young people, you never used this snotty, supercilious tone with your parents, did you? Because here's my daughter at 16 with that total snotty, supercilious tone. Every parent here knows that tone, you know what I mean? Like my son Liam just recovered from being a totally snotty teenager. The highlight or the low light of which was one time I said to him, hey, how you doing? What do you mean by that? He said, I was like, what? <laughs> I know I said I'd be home at midnight, says my daughter, but I'm the one who said that. So when I decided to not be home at midnight. I was not actually late because I can change my mind. It's like, 
What? I thought the top of my head was going to fly off, you know? Why do we have to wear socks that match? Dad doesn't wear socks that match. He says they match, but they do not match. Dad is a sock liar. <laughs> this is what I want to make gravestone. Brian Doyle, sock liar. <laughs> One time I walk in the kitchen and my son Joey, our sons are like six or seven and little crew cut guys and they were surrounded by packs of other little crew cut guys. And I walk in the kitchen one day, and there's my son Joe explaining the rules of the Doyle family to, to his buddies. It's like six or seven little guys. And rule number one, wear pants. Pants are important, <laughs> you know. Uh, but Joe, I walk in as Joey's explaining this rule to his friends. If our dad dies, our mom has to marry his next younger brother. And if he dies, she has to marry Uncle Tommy because he's the last brother in the family. But if Uncle Tommy dies, our mom is an unrestricted free agent. <laughs> it's like, God, did I say that to the kids, you know? Belts are fascist. Dad says so. Fascist means for fat people. <laughs> when our dad tells a joke, most of the time he's the only one who laughs. <laughs> yeah, that's stung. How come the only things that get made into sandwiches are animals and vegetables? How come we don't have mineral sandwiches if minerals are so good for you? Good question. Fair question. The reason the ocean is salty is because all the animals in it have been peeing in it since before there was such a thing as time. <laughs> good, good science thing to know, don't you think? <laughs> you know? Dad says all beings are holy in the same proportions except the New York Yankees who are the spawn of Satan. <laughs> that one I love to read when I'm in New York. <laughs> anyway, on and on it goes. You know. Mom says camping is a way to see God up close, but Dad says that God loves us and wants us to shower every day. <laughs> you know? On and on and on and on. Oh, one more just for fun. This, I'm, sure that, I'm sure this is true of Marietta and, and everywhere in Atlanta, but when I first moved to my small town, the town I live in in Oregon, we've been living for 25 years. The first week I was there, I picked up our paper, our local little paper, and discovered the police log. The police log. All of American literature is in your police log in your small town paper. It is. So here's some highlights from our police log. It's taken word for word. You know, I discovered later that the police dispatcher would, would send the information to the lazy reporter, and the reporter would just flow it right into the paper without any touching, right? So this is direct from the police dispatcher. Man at the bank on State Street reported that a woman in a red jacket asked him if he thought that money was important. Police searched the area but could not locate the woman. What? <laughs> Complaint on Woodhurst Place, grass on neighbor's lawn too tall, responding officer measures the grass, 36 inches. <laughs> Squirrel attacks golfer at ninth hole on Wednesday on the public course. This may be the greatest sentence ever written in America, come to think of it. <laughs> Squirrel attacks golfer at ninth hole on Wednesday at the public course. Staff at the course report seeing the squirrel, quote unquote, acting strange. <laughs> Again on Thursday, quote, an officer was sent to the scene to investigate but made no arrests, unquote. <laughs> what? I always imagine the poor squirrel with his hands behind his back like, go ahead and take me, copper, <laughs> you know. Woman reports that someone has stolen her bank card and is making deposits to her account. Man seen near junior high school wearing a large sandwich board in which he has printed, trust Jesus or go to hell. <laughs> large golden retriever stole a sandwich from a police officer on Monroe Parkway. Dog last seen headed north. <laughs> One more, squirrel reported, quote unquote, intoxicated on Cornell Street, quote, not same squirrel as golf course. <laughs> you know, you couldn't make this up if you tried, uh, you know? So, let's see. Here, let me read you this. A, a, if you're like me, uh, you have dark days. We call them black dog days in the Irish world. Uh, days when you just can't seem to get out. You, you just you got darkness on your shoulders, it's a dark snow falling, and you just can't find that little chink of light, right, to, to kind of get back up on your bicycle and off you go. And, and so I had one of those days, uh, in particular after September 11th, I was telling the students this morning, three of my friends were murdered on September 11th. Tommy Crotty, Farrell Lynch, Sean Lynch. Good men, good big Irish Catholic boys. Tommy was a college basketball player. Uh, you know, Farrell and Sean were the first guys in their families ever to wear a white collar, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, but after that time in particular, I was really, I was really hammered, you know, and my friends had been murdered. Uh, to be an American 
Uh, it's always September 12th, it seems to me, for Americans. You know, that's been a haunting hole in our lives, and it always will be. You know, and the same thing with December 14th, which is coming up. Your homework assignment is sitting in your lap, I hope. You have a piece in your lap called Dawn and Mary. Your homework assignment today is you read that piece in the next 24 hours, and then you make 10 copies of that piece, and you give it to 10 friends. And they make 10 copies of that piece. And on and on it goes. And if we do this right, everybody in the United States will read that piece before December 14th. And it has nothing to do with Brian Doyle and everything to do with us as human beings. You know the story of Dawn and Mary? Dawn and Mary, December 14th, Sandy Hook Elementary School, 9 in the morning, another boring staff meeting, yet another boring staff meeting in the principal's office. And they hear pop, pop, pop in the hallway. Worst sound you could hear. The worst sound you can hear in a school, gunfire. And the teacher, the principal, Dawn Hoxfrung, jumps up from her chair and says, according to survivors, she says to everybody else in the meeting, you know what that means. We were trained for this. Do the training. Do it. Down on the ground. Lock the door behind me. Use the table as defense if necessary. Lock the door behind me. And she runs out into the hallway, followed to her absolute amazement by Mary Sherback. Mary Sherback was the staff psychologist at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. And according to survivors, the last thing they heard Mary Sherback say on this one wild, blessed, bruised earth was to Dawn Hoxsprung, you're not going out there without me. Oh, oh, the courage, the courage. And the two women, these two brave women, they run out into the hallway, and there's the poor stupid kid with the rifle, Adam Lanza, Adam Lanza, and they run right at the rifle. Is there a word for this? I say no. I spent 35 years trying to find words to drape on stories, and I don't know any words for Dawn and Mary. All I can do is tell you, there were these two women once, man, and they did the thing that didn't make any sense. Illogical, nonsensical, unreasonable, silly, ridiculous. No way do you run at a rifle knowing, and I think they knew, both of them, they were going to get their heads blown off, and they ran right at the rifle anyway. You know? What word applies to that, my friends? You know? You and I know Dawn Hoxsprung and Mary Sherback deep in our hearts. I need to tell you nothing of the shape of their lives, of their husbands and their children and their cabins on the lake. I need to tell you nothing of the biographical detail, but I tell you that story about Dawn and Mary, you know who they are, don't you? Every fiber of their bodies, especially Dawn Hoxsprung, the principal of Sandy Hook Elementary School, I bet I know what she was thinking at that last second before she died. She was running at that rifle thinking, you want to get to the kids in my school? You are coming through me. Man, the courage, you know. So don't you let December 14th be another damn day in the paper. We're only an anniversary. We're all horror and all these nice, you know, these ceremonies and blah, blah, blah. You remember the courage that day. The incredible, defiant grace of those people. And the same thing on September 11th. Don't let September 11th be an anniversary. It's not an anniversary. It's a day when there was unbelievable courage and grace and mercy beyond sense. And every one of us is capable of this. You know what I'm talking about. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Inside you and you and you and you and you and you and you are Dawn and Mary. Are the firemen who ran up that day on September 11th? Are the guy who carried a lady down in a wheelchair 40 freaking flights? Everybody's capable of that kind of wild courage, you know? Why we only let it boil out in moments of terrible duress is a mystery to me. I wish it boiled out all the time. In the boring moments, I wish all our courage and wild love came pouring out of us, but it doesn't work that way yet. But it might if we share the stories that matter, you know? I was telling the students this morning, Bin Laden murdered three of my friends. Slime, slime, hiding in a cave. You coward, you know, cowering in this cave, laughing when he heard that children were on the planes. He laughed, he cackled. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. And for the longest time, I wanted to wring his neck. 
you know? And now what I would say all these years later, I wouldn't kill him, you know? I wouldn't, because I would just be joining this, I'd be doing the same as him, stupid, you know? Violence is a failure of the imagination, as William Stafford said in my state, Oregon. Violence is a failure of the imagination. I would say to Bin Laden, you poor fool, you stupid fool. Do you not understand? I got stories bigger than your story. Your story is old, 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 my friend. Your story is bloody. Your story is murder. Your story is fear and terror and oh, ash and smoke and fire and children cowering. Your story is going out of business, you stupid man. That's what I would say to him, you know? You want a story that's bigger than yours? Let me tell you about Dawn and Mary. Let me tell you about the firemen who ran up that day knowing they would never come back down. A friend of mine was a fireman on September 11th, and I called him up and said, did those guys, were they gonna put out the fire? He goes, what, on the 108th floor? What are you, nuts? I said, then why did they run up? As Springsteen says, they must have seen the faces of their wives and children floating in the smoke. Why did they do that? There's no words for this. Duty, honor, responsibility, occupation. That's silly, that's ridiculous. Courage, man, love. The only word that comes near to it is love, some kind of wild love, you know? We are a people of creativity. We are not a violent people in the end. Why does America matter? Because we have our heads, you know? I just talked to a guy who was just back from Iraq. He was, in, he was in a lot of gun battles, and I said to him, what was your greatest weapon? He goes, this one, right here. I don't need to use this if I learn how to use this. You know, who's going to argue with this guy? I ain't arguing with a guy who's just been in Iraq. What are you, nuts? You know, so. Story, story, story. That's, you know, stories. Stories matter, man. I tell you, you can read a thousand books about September 11th, and I tell you stories. The guy who caught a baby, the college football player who caught a baby. Lady's running down from the killer cloud. Got a baby in her arms. You know, she's booking it. The, kill, the cowards go down, and the, you know, here comes that killer cloud. People died in that cloud. Mm. You know, whirling pieces of metal, killing people. And, and the guy steps out and he sees a lady booking it with the baby and he, and, he, and he steps back behind the wall to protect himself. And I heard him on the radio and he said, all my life I'll be ashamed of myself because I stepped back behind the wall for a whole second. And then he steps back out because he realizes, I'm a man, deal with it. And he steps out and he sees the lady and he yells at her and he goes, throw me the baby! And the, and the woman, the mother is like, she's in, she, you know, she's, she's going to save that baby or die. Mm -hmm. You know, and she's got the maternal thing big time. And, and she throws him to baby, and the guy makes the catch, and he said in the radio, I had to pull over, I was crying. The guy makes the catch, catches the baby, and he goes, I suddenly realized, a little later, a couple of days later, I realized, all, all those practices, all those days in the white room, all those games, all those push-ups, all those sit-ups, it was all for that moment. It was for the moment that I caught the baby, you know? Oh, my man. Stories like that, you know, that make, it makes violence look stupid, you know? So... Here I'm ranting and raving. I just did a reading and a lady said to me, so you're Catholic? I said, well, yes, ma'am. We just spent an hour talking about Catholic stuff. And you're all Catholic, right? I mean, we're all on the same page here, right? And you're all Catholic and you speak Irish? Good. <laughs> you know. hmm, do you want to learn rude Irish? Can I teach people vulgar Irish? <laughs> Last year, hi, can I do that? Does anybody speak Gaelic? No? Oh, my God. Let's have a Gaelic lesson. The first Gaelic I learned from my grandmother. Ready? Repeat after me. Pogue. Oh, louder than that. Pogue? Pogue. Mahone. Mahone. Then you put it together. Pogue Mahone. Pogue Mahone. That means kiss my butt in Irish. <laughs> <laughs> my, grandmother, my grandmother taught us this when we were children. Pogue Mahone, gimini dia tu, which means kiss my butt, God bless you, which is very, it's very Irish. <laughs> you know. He was a terrible man, God rest his soul. <laughs> That's, you know, so. Well, that was a low moment in Lasseter High, sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, let me read you this, t where I began was, and when you have dark days, one time I finally just couldn't get out of it. I was reading all about people on September 11th, 3,000 people murdered, 200 people murdered at the Pentagon, 100 people murdered on the plane, you know, I just, and, and the thing that kills me now with children, now that I have children is, I can't take damaged children anymore, I can't take it, man. I read every day, I pick up the paper, and there's another frightened child. You know, and I just can't take it anymore. And so one day I pick up the paper, and there's a picture of yet another mother running away from yet another war with yet another terrified child on her shoulder. And, and I was just, it just, that day it just broke me and I put my head down on the paper and sobbed right into the paper. My son Joey loves the story, he goes, yeah, dad, when you lifted up your head, you had New York Times written backwards on your head. 
It's like, go to your room. <laughs> you know? But that day, I struggled all day. Like I had nothing. I couldn't find anything in my fingertips or in my mouth to, to fight back. I couldn't find any stories. And then I finally thought, well, I'll just write down all the little things, right? I'll write down all the little cool things, right? So I wrote this, cool things. As a fan's notes for grace and a quavery chant against the dark and a hurrah from the hustings, I sing a song that, of things that make us grin and bow, that just for an instant let us see sometimes the web and weave of merciful, the endless possible, the incomprehensible, inexhaustible, inexplicable yes of everything. Such as, for example, to name a few, the way the sun crawls over the rim of the world every morning like a child's face rising, beaming from a pool all fresh from the womb of the dark. And the way jays probe and swifts chitter. And the way a young mother at the bus stop has her infant swaddled and huddled against her chest like a blinking extra heart. And the way a very large woman wears the tiniest miniskirt with a careless, airy pride that makes me so happy I can hardly squeak. And the way seals peer at me owlishly from the surf like rubbery grandfathers. And the way cormorants in the ocean never, ever, ever get caught by onrushing waves but disappear casually at the last possible second so you see their headlong black stories written on the wet walls of the sea. And the way no pavement, asphalt, macadam, concrete, cement thing can ultimately defeat a tiny, relentless green thing. And the way people sometimes lean eagerly face first into the future. And the way infants finally discover to their absolute astonishment that those fists swooping by like tiny, fleshy comets belong to them. And the way when my mom gets caught unaware by a joke, she barks with laughter so infectious that people laugh two towns away. And the way one of my sons sleeps every night with his right leg hanging over the side of the bed like an oar, no matter how many times I fold him back into the boat of the bed. And the way the refrigerator hums to itself in two different keys at night. And the way the new puppy noses through hay fields like a headlong, exuberant, hairy tractor. And the way my daughter always makes one final immense cookie the size of a door when she makes cookies. And the way one son hasn't had a haircut since Napoleon was emperor. And the way crows arrange themselves sometimes on the fence, like the notes of a song I don't know yet. And the way car engines sigh for a few minutes after you turn them off. And the way your arm goes all totally nonchalant when you drive through summer with the window down. And the way people touch each other's forearms when they're scared. And the way every once in a while someone you hardly know says something so piercingly honest that you want to just kneel down there in the grocery store near the pears and cry. And the way little children fall asleep with their mouths open like fish. And the way sometimes just a sidelong glance from someone you love makes you all shaky for a second before you get your mask back on. And the way some people, when they laugh, tilt their heads way back like they need more room for all the hilarity in their heads. And the way hawks and eagles always look so annoyed. <laughs> and the way people shuffle daintily in icy pavements doing the winter dance. And the way churches smell dense with hope. And the way men's pants bench up at the knees when they stand after kneeling in church. And the way knees are gnarled. And the way faces curve around your mouth and eyes according to how many times you smiled and laughed over your lifetime. And the way people fall asleep in chairs by the fire and snap awake startled and amazed, unsure just for a second what planet exactly they're on. Which is a good question we should ask each other more than we do, it seems to me. Look, I know, I know all too well the brooding, misshapen evil is everywhere, in the brightest houses, in the most cheerful denials, in what we do and what we fail to do. And I know too well that the story of the world is entropy. Things fly apart, we sicken, we fail, we grow weary, we're hammered, we're hounded by loss and accident and tragedy. But I also know, with all my hoary heart, that we are carved of immense, confusing holiness, and that the whole point of this, the whole point of us, is grace under duress that you either take a flying leap at nonsensical, illogical, unreasonable ideas like marriage and marathons and democracy and divinity, or you huddle alone brooding behind the wall. I believe the coolest things there are cannot be measured, calibrated, calculated, gauged, weighed, or understood, except sometimes by having a child patiently explain it to you, which is another thing that should happen far more often than it does. In short, I believe in believing, which doesn't make any sense at all, which gives me all the hope I need this morning. Amen. Mm. I mean, that's not bad. <laughs> Thank you. That's, I've never read that. As my brother T Tommy says, hey, that's better than a stick in the eye. <laughs> you know? 
My brothers are, oh, speaking of my brothers, I wrote a novel a few years ago called Mink River. Anybody read Mink River? Raise your hand. One? Oh, for God's sake. What, the rest of you didn't read Mink River? What was so important? Oh, sorry. My mother says you cannot yell at people for not reading your books. <laughs> it's bad form. So it's a really wild novel. It's, it's, a, it's a very, if you've read anything by me, I have this, I have this serpentine, river-eyed, sinuous, you know, flowing, rollicking thing. I really, I love, I, lo I want to write like people talk and, and how we think. Nobody speaks in little subject verb object sentences. Did you go to the store? Nobody speaks like that. That's silly. Everybody's like, Rrm, you know, and so I want to write that way. So, so my experience with my novel and, and with much of the rest of my work is that people either love it or hate it. There's no in between, you know, especially with this novel. I've never had anybody come up to me and said, oh, I liked it okay. It was like people either come up to me and go, oh my God, I totally loved it. I can't believe it ended. I just got a letter from a lady who said, you know, I just, I, I loved your novel. I got all the way to the end and then it ended. She was kind of upset. I was like, sorry. <laughs> You know, I just got another letter from a guy who said, novels are not supposed to be written that way. And I'm like, I, I missed the meeting, man. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get the memo. I'm so sorry. You know. Anyway, so uh, people who love Mink River, my novel, come up to me at readings and talks and stuff like that, or they write to me. I mean, I've been inundated. A, a student asked me today, a student newspaper asked me, you know, what's the best thing for you about being a writer? I said, oh, nobody in the history of American writing has ever gotten the letters that I got. I've gotten hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of absolutely beautiful, heartfelt letters. Nobody's ever been so moved as me, it seems to me. Maybe I'm wrong, but, but, uh, but on the other hand, people who don't like my work hate it. I mean, they really hate it. And so people who either write to me or they come up to me, who, people who like it, people who don't like it go online. This is why God invented the web, is so that people can go online and insult Brian Doyle. So my brothers, my many brothers, Six, six brothers, I have to count. Shemus, let me, <laughs> uh, my brothers love keeping uh, a top 10 list of nasty things said about Brian Doyle's novel, Mink River. And sadly, it's a monthly list. It changes every month because there's always new candidates, <laughs> right? So my brother Peter's in charge. My brothers take turns. Who's in charge for a year, right? My brother Peter's in charge for 2014. He just sent me this month's list. Number one, top 10 insulting things said about Mink River. Number one, this is the worst book ever written. W-O-R-S-E, <laughs> which we think is very funny, yeah, you know. Number two, an all-male book club in Connecticut. Our whole book club bought this terrible book, and we all read this terrible book all the way to the end, and all 13 of us hated this terrible book. So, as my brother Kevin said, so they all bought it, and they all read it all the way to the end. Winner! <laughs> <laughs> God help me. Number four, I have no patience with sentences that go on for an entire page or consist only of lists. This book was a terrible slog. Why would a publisher let this happen? <laughs> I love the plaintive note there. Why would a publisher let this happen? <laughs> on and on and on. Let's see. Oh, uh, number eight. I tried to listen to this book on audio tape, but couldn't get past the author's droning nasal voice. Now, this is particularly interesting because there is no audio book for Mink River. <laughs> so my brothers and I are obsessed. What book was she reading? <laughs> so I send notes to all my friends who are novelists saying, Dear David Duncan, I think she's reading The River Why. <laughs> you know? So I get notes back from all my, all my writer friends. Dear Brian, go, to, go away. Love, Barry. You know? Number nine, someone ought to send this poor man a box of unused periods. <laughs> my brother Kevin, after one of my books, my brother Kevin sent me a whole page of commas with a little note. You can use these, you know. <laughs> he thought that was funny. Why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> Number 10, clearly this is an author addicted to adjectives because he seems to have used every single one in the English language 50 times each in this book, sometimes in the same sentence. <laughs> I love it. I send these to my mom. <laughs> Dear mom, check this one out. You know, let's see. Uh, oh, let me read you this because a, a student asked me today, you know, have you read pieces? We were talking about how I think with writing, if you know the ending of the thing that you're going to write, then maybe you're just writing journalism. And there's a great place for journalism. News, data, information, very useful. It's enormously useful. And yet, 
It's only news and data and information. You know, I sometimes feel bad for, for your generation because you guys are slathered by so much information. And, and you have to develop some kind of a, a parsing filter, right? This matters and it doesn't matter, but you're just inundated by it, you know? And, and so, so I think I'm really obsessed with story because I think there's, there's news and information, there's data, and in this story, two different things, you know? Like with students today, I was telling them, hey man, how many people got murdered in the Holocaust? Six million, 10 million, 20 million probably, scholars think, 20 million people. How many books been written about the Holocaust? Half a million, you know? It, it, you know and you'll, freak, you'll never remember none of that. You, there's no way to tell that many stories. But if I tell you a story of a 15-year-old girl who had to hide in a house for years because if she came out, somebody would shoot her in the head, you'll never forget that, will you? You'll never forget the story of Anne Frank, you know? And so a story can carry, a story has such huge shoulders. There's news and there's information, and then there's stories, two different things. You know, you'll, the rest of your life, on December 14th every year, you'll pick up the paper and listen to the radio and hear TV on TV, and people will be talking about Sandy Hook Elementary. They tore the school down because they don't want to talk about it anymore, right? People, blah, 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 blah. You'll remember Dorn and Mary. There's a story, and then there's information. Right? Two different things. So, so a student said to me today, we were talking about how you should be surprised sometimes by what you wrote. And, and, and she goes, have you done that? And I said, oh yeah, many times. And the one time I finished the piece uh, crying so hard, I thought I was going to electrocute myself crying into my keyboard. <laughs> but uh, it was this piece called A Sin. Committed a sin yesterday in the hallway at noon. I roared at my son. I grabbed him by the shirt collar. I frightened him so badly that he cowered and wept. And when he turned to run, I grabbed him by the arm so roughly that he flinched. And it was that flicker of fear and pain across his face, the bright, eager, holy, riveting face I've loved for 10 years that stopped me then and haunts me this morning, for I'm the father of his fear. I sent it snarling into his heart, and I can never get it out now, which torments me. Yes, he was picking on his brother. And yes, he picked on his brother all morning. And yes, this was the culmination of many incidents already. And no, he didn't pay the slightest attention to what his father said. And yes, he'd been snide and supercilious all day. And yes, he did deliberately the thing I told him not to do. But still, I roared at him, and I grabbed him by the shoulder, and I terrified him, and I made him cower. And now there's a dark, evil wriggle between him and me that makes me sit here with my hands over my face, ashamed to the bottom of my bones. I don't know how sins can be forgiven. I get the concept. I admire the genius of the idea. I suspect it to be the seed of all real peace. I savor the Desmond Tutus and Mahatma Gandhis who had the mad courage to live by it. But I don't understand how foul can be made fair. What's done can't be undone. And my moment of rage in the hallway is an indelible scar on his heart and mine. And while my heart is a ragged old bag after half a century of slings and stings, his is still new, eager, open, suggestible, innocent. He's committed only the small sins of a child, the halting first lies, the failed test paper hidden in the closet, the window broken in petulance, the stolen candy bar. The silent witness as a classmate is bullied. The insults flung at the dinner table like bitter knives. Whereas I'm a man and have had many lies squirming in my mouth and have evaded the mag and rad, mad and ragged in the street, ignored the stinking Christ, his rotten teeth, his cloak of soggy newspapers, his voice of broken glass. No God can forgive what we do to each other. Only the injured can summon that extraordinary grace, and where such grace is born we cannot say, for all our fitful genius and miraculous machinery. We use the word God so easily, so casually, as if our label for the incomprehensible meant anything at all. And we forget too easily that the wriggle of holy is born only through the stammer and stumble of us, who are always children. So we turn again and again to each other and we bow and ask forgiveness and mill what mercy we can muster from the muddle of our hearts. The instant I let go of my son's sinewy arm in the hallway, he sprinted away and slammed the door and flew off the porch and ran down the street. And I stood there, simmering in shame. <laughs> and I walked down the hill into the laurel thicket as dense and silent as the dawn of the world, and found him there huddled and sobbing. 
We sat in the moist green dark for a long time, not saying anything. The branches burly and patient. Finally, I asked for his forgiveness, and he asked for mine. And we walked out of the woods hand in hand, changed men. Amen. Mm. 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 Here I'm crying in public. I just talked to my mom and she says, are you still crying in public? I said, yes, mom. She goes, good boy. <laughs> we discovered we have an annual Cayley. You see, you're all Irish. You know, the annual, the Cayley is like your family reunion slash festival, you know, and every year at the Cayley we discover some new thing that we never knew in the family's life before, right? So last year the discovery was, when I was a child, the first words I heard every morning of my childhood, uh, we, we had seven boys and one girl, right? So the boys slept two by two, you know, poor white trash, we slept two by two. And uh, my mother had this weird capacity, she'd tiptoe in in the morning and be able to wake you up with a touch, it wasn't static electricity, I hear you thinking, <laughs> but she would be able to tiptoe in and just touch you on the shoulder and, and wake you up with these words. She would touch me gently not, and not wake up my brother Peter, with whom I slept, but she would touch me and say, Brian, you, you are the smartest and handsomest of all the brothers. You'll never be the tallest, but you are the smartest and handsomest of all the brothers. Well, last year at the Cayley, <laughs> we discovered my mother said this to all the brothers. <laughs> what a shock! <laughs> You know, it was no kidding. It somehow it boiled over at the table, and, and my brothers and I are like, what? She, she said that to you? And like, our whole ch childhood foundation fell down, you know. And it was one of those great moments. My brothers and I are all sitting there going, oh. Like, we're sitting there in total silence, you know, and, and then there's a long pause, like a pregnant pause. I know what a pregnant pause is now. And, and then my sister down at the end of the table says, and mom and dad thought you guys were smart. <laughs> Unbelievable, hmm? you know. Let's see, let me read, uh, uh, oh, let me read you this, which I've not read. I got a novel, I have a, new, a novel coming out in April, and uh, so it hasn't been published yet, but the editor of the novel, he's a great guy, uh, used this piece of the novel when he got married. So, so a piece of my novel's been read in the air in Hawaii. Isn't that sweet? I was really knocked out by it. And it's a wedding scene. There's a scene up on a mountain in a meadow. There's a way people get married in a meadow, a young couple. And they ask a friend to get up and speak. And so this is what the woman says. No one can speak for all of us. And I read this on purpose because people are gathered together in a room, right? When people gather together in a room, some kind of a thing is possible. And it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with us. We gather together here as Americans, as human beings, as a species, right? And once in a while, it seems to me, when people gather in a room together, there's some kind of energy, or if you're all facing in the same direction with your heart, somehow it matters, you know what I mean? Like, we use words like prayer and community, and we use them lightly, but there's a lot deeper thing than any religion can claim. And believe me, as a Catholic, we've claimed it, <laughs> you know? So, 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 so this is a communal, this is for us. No one can speak for all of us today, but someone ought to try. We're gathered here with respect and affection for this man and this woman, who today, before all of us, go deeper into the mystery. Certainly, we're here to witness, we're here to support, we're here to celebrate, but we're also here as living testimony, each and every one of us, that when they need help, when they need attention and assistance against foul wind and dark tide, we will be there. When they are troubled, we will lend them our ears. When they seek counsel, we will lend them what little wisdom we have. When they're helpless, we will lend them our hands and our hearts. When they're dark, we will endeavor to bring them light. When they are hungry, we will endeavor to bring them sustenance of whatever kind we can provide. That's what we do here in this place. That's what we promise by our presence in this place. This ceremony is about all of us. We're bound each to each in this place, even if we don't admit it, except in times like this. We don't have to like each other here, but we have to attend to each other. We're graced and blessed to be in this mountain, in this town, in this state, in this country, in this world. And we are especially graced to be asked to witness and celebrate the love of two people we cherish. To be asked to be with them on the day they dive deeper into life together, not knowing where it will take them, is a gift from them to us that no one can measure. We will savor this day. We'll enjoy every minute of it. We'll remember it for years to come. 
But most of all, we'll remember that on this brilliant day, this man and this woman shared with us the joy and prayer of their love. And there's no greater gift than that, to share your love. So let us thank them together, here, now, with our hands and our voices raised in blessing, older and deeper than any religion. And to say to them in one voice, we celebrate you, we will carry you in our hearts as two made one from this day forward. Amen. Hmm. Hey, that's not bad. I never read that either. Ha ha ha. Thank you. Do, do I have any time? What time is it? Oh, geez, Louise. Do you guys want to do questions and stuff? Yeah? No? Should I just keep reading? Can we just keep telling stories? Uh. All right. Can I break it up? I'll tell you a story quick. Uh, I really and truly met the Dalai Lama, and I love to tell the story because it proves that I'm a complete idiot, which is always refreshing to remember. <laughs> you know, my brothers remind me regularly, but <laughs> you know. So, so at my university, we just had the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu were just at my university in the last year. My father said, "What? You couldn't get any Catholic people to visit?" And I was like, "Dad, stop!" You know, what are you a visiting pagan program? He says, "I was like, Dad, stop." <laughs> So there are many funny stories. Desmond Tutu is an interesting guy. Did you ever hear Tutu speak? Tutu comes to Atlanta all the time, does he not? Did you ever hear, anybody ever hear the man speak? He has a voice like chipmunk on acid. You know, it's like, Desmond Tutu! <laughs> you know, and he has the highest pitch laugh I've ever hear, heard in a human being. Desmond Tutu, hee 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 hee! You know, it's like, wow, somebody's been sniffing helium today. <laughs> I don't know what you Anglicans do over there in South Africa, but, <laughs> you know. Anyway, the Dalai Lama comes and, uh, we're at, at my university, I work in the marketing and public relations office, so we're going to take his picture with everybody who ever lived, apparently, right? So we set up a white screen and two little X's on the floor, and we do this in my university's Athletic Hall of Fame room, which is filled with shrines to great athletes of the past. At my university, is 120 years old. So we had a great football team in the old days. We beat Oregon and Oregon State in the same season in 1908. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I'm in this room by myself, the photographer leaves, and I'm standing in there by myself, wearing the same shirt, come to think of it. And, and uh, well, the Dalai Lama, you remember, is a rock star, right? He, he, and he's got an entourage. He's got like 20 or 30 other Buddhist monks that are with him all the time, handling things on their cell phones. He's got State Department agents hanging around. And you forget that he was not only the pope of his religion, but he was the president of Tibet, you know, and, uh, until recently. So he's a, he's a hugely, he's surrounded by a huge entourage of, of other monks. And, you know, no offense, <laughs> there it is again. But the, they all kind of look the same, the monks. They have the maroon and saffron thing going on, and they all have crew cuts, and they all look like old halfbacks, you know. And, and so, so, so all these monks are milling around in the hallway, and I'm standing in the room by myself. You know, it's a fairly small room. And in bustles this monk, and he comes right up to me. Real direct guy. You know, he comes right up and he goes, Hi, how you doing? And I'm thinking, all right, a Buddhist monk from Brooklyn. <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> you know, and and he, I said, good, how you doing? And he goes, good. Who are all these people on the walls? Real direct guy. Real laser direct with his attentiveness. And I said, well, they're mostly football players. We have the greatest women's soccer team in the world. So about five years from now, it'll be all women on the walls. But right now, it's mostly football players. And, uh, you know, and he goes, oh, that's too bad. Because soccer is the greatest sport of all. I said, no, it isn't. Basketball is the greatest sport of all. I was thinking, what's this guy's problem? <laughs> you know, <laughs> did he not have any coffee this morning? I mean, why, why, you know, and I said, no, it isn't. Basketball is the greatest sport of all. And he steps closer to me. He's already close enough, and he steps closer right into the personal space bubble, right? And shaking his finger in my face, says to me, "Maybe you didn't hear me. I said, soccer is the greatest sport of all." And I said to him, "Maybe you didn't hear me, pal." actually said that, pal. My brother Kevin said, thank God you didn't say bub, okay? Because <laughs> that would just be rude. <laughs> so maybe you didn't hear me, pal. Soccer's a great sport. Very sinuous and quicksilver, but nobody scores. <laughs> you know, soccer is the sport that invented the 0-0 zero, zero tie. <laughs> Whereas basketball, it's a very sinuous and quicksilver sport. Everybody scores all the time. You know, 140, 150. That's my kind of game, man. And as these words left the prison of my teeth, I realized that standing in front of me was the Dalai Lama. <laughs> Not a Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama. There's only one of these guys, and he's the incarnation of the Buddha of compassion, standing in front of me, and I just called him pal. 
unbelievable. And to his eternal credit, he roared with laughter. And just at that second, at that exact instant, as those words left my mouth, and, I, and I, as the words were floating through the air toward his holy and capacious ear, I, was, I, was, I suddenly realized who he was. As the words, I was like, no! <laughs> and, and the words landed in his ear. I was like, oh, no, unbelievable, stupid, stupid, stupid. And just at that second, in floods the entourage. Right? And it turns out in Tibetan tradition, the Dalai Lama enters a room by himself to clear out bad spirits. <laughs> why is that funny? That is not funny. I don't know. Everybody laughs when that happens. Like, why is that funny? So, but it's some kind of magic time. It's like some magic Tibetan thing, like 111 seconds or 199 seconds, some weird thing. But, it, but they have it, of course, calibrated to the microsecond, these poor guys, because they're always on the road, right? This poor man will never go home. His country was eaten by the country next to him. So he, he'll never go, his country's not on the map anymore. He'll never go home. You know what town he's from? Roaring Tiger. <laughs> Isn't that cool? He'll never see his friends and family again back in Tibet. You know, his friends and family and, and cousins and all teammates that he used to play soccer with, killed, murdered by the chain. I mean, he'll never go home. He's always on the road all his life. He'll never see his hometown ever again, you know? And so, th so, so these guys all have this calibrated to the nanosecond, right? So they all flood in at exactly the time that they know he should be done. And, and so, 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 oh, your holiness, and we really must go, and blah, blah, blah. He's always slightly late for, for talks, it turns out. So they hustle him off, right? And I'm standing there thinking, unbelievable, oh my God, all my life I wanted to, oh my, I'm obsessed with grace and mercy and humor and forgiveness and joy, and, and this guy is the perfect avatar of all the things that I've ever been obsessed by. All he does is face horror and loss and murder with laughter and, and mercy and humility. He doesn't think he's cool. How cool is that? You know, and, and I could have talked to him about all the stuff that really obsesses me, but we had an argument about sports. <laughs> Unbelievable. So I'm standing there thinking, oh no, and they hustle him off. They, your holiness, your holiness, and they, they get him all the way to the doorway, right? And then suddenly he turns and parts the entourage and he, and he steps back into the room and he goes, you! And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> It's already been a hard day for me. <laughs> he goes, yo! I said, what? He, I'm thinking, he's, he's going to excommunicate me. And then I realized, wait a minute, he's not Catholic. He can't excommunicate me. <laughs> he can't send me to hell. He's not Catholic. <laughs> yo! I was like, what? And he goes, we'll continue this conversation in this lifetime or the next. <laughs> this big booming laugh, you know. Oh, my God, he has the best laugh you ever heard in your life. Oh, 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 oh. And then off he goes, you know. So I'm standing there with my knees shaking. Unbelievable. So I go home that day, and I come into the house, and there's my lovely bride at the, you know, in the kitchen, and she asks me the traditional husband-wife question, how was your day? And usually you say, good, can I have a beer? And, and she goes, how was your day? And I said, Mira, you wouldn't believe it. I, I got to meet the Dalai Lama. I met the Dalai Lama. Unbelievable. The Dalai Lama. I got to talk to the Dalai Lama for like two minutes. She goes, oh, my God, you'd be kidding. One of the greatest spiritual visionaries in the history of human beings. What'd you talk about? I was like, ah. Ah, ah, sports. <laughs> and, and she said, what? And I said, uh, we got into a slight uh, a disagreement uh, about uh, sports. <laughs> and, and she goes, you had an argument with the Dalai Lama about sports. <laughs> I said, and up row, every guy here knows what I mean. When somebody attacks you for something stupid that you did, up rises the defensive sap. Am I right? You know, yeah, I peed in a gas tank because I wanted to. That's why. <laughs> you know, whatever stupid thing you do, suddenly you've got to defend your stupid, right? Actually, come to think of it, every woman here knows what I'm talking about because you know guys. <laughs> Right? So, so up rises that defensive sap. I could feel it rising. I was like, yeah, we talked, to, we had an argument about sports. Because he said that soccer was the coolest sport of all, and that's just silly. So when somebody says something silly like that, you should slap it down right quick, I feel. And so she stomps off down the hallway, you know, slamming every door along the way. Stomp, 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 slam! Stomp, 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 slam! Stomp, stomp, I should have married that Bobby Hayward, for God's sake. Slam! And, you know... <laughs> So I'm standing in the kitchen, our sons are there. Sons are like nine, and, uh, or, or I don't know, 12 at the time. Fanatic basketball players, my sons. And 
<laughs> my son Joey, there's a long pause as the family, as my son's digest that mom's stomping off down the hallway and dad apparently is a complete total pumpkin of a human being. And, and then my son Joey says, but dad, you were right, so what's the problem? <laughs> I was like, yeah! There's <laughs> some money for you, kid. <laughs> You're in the will. <laughs> so anyway. So a few years, this, I used to, that used to be the end of the story, but there's one last new codicil. A few, couple of years ago, a few years ago, I got really sick. I got a bad sickness where my hands and feet shut off. Okay, weird, really weird, scary. And so my sister, who's a, in a Buddhist monastery, a good Catholic family, we got a nun in the family. We don't care what brand, as my mother says. <laughs> so my sister sends a letter to the Dalai Lama with a picture of me saying, uh, my brother's really sick, if you could pray for him, that would be really great. You may remember my brother, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And she gets a letter back from the Dalai Lama who says, yes, of course, we'll pray for your brother. Uh, and you tell your brother for me that he's wrong. <laughs> Signed with the official seal of the, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It's very embarrassing. It's in her monastery. As you walk in the door, there's this letter framed and hanging right there. It's very embarrassing. I hate visiting. <laughs> so. Anyway, so that'd be a good place to stop. But let me, can, can I ask you one last favor? I mean, we do questions and stuff if you want, but this is an irresistible chance to do a cool thing. Do it with me, okay? When people gather together, some kind of a thing is possible. Really and truly, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not blowing smoke on you. You know what I mean. And it has nothing to do with church and patriotism. And it has to do with human beings facing in the same direction. So I ask you two favors. One, you got a homework assignment, and you will take it serious. You will take that piece and make copies and share that piece, and we will remember Dawn Hawksprung and Mary Sherbeck. We will not forget them, and we will not let anybody else forget them. On that day, you remember those 20 little kids, those 20 little kids, little tiny kindergarten kids, and the six teachers who died with them, including the teacher who they found covering two children with her body. Hmm. You know, you remember that. You remember the courage that day, you know. Poor Adam Lanza, that poor stupid kid. You know the story of Adam Lanza? Adam Lanza was a geek. Nobody sat with Adam Lanza at the cafeteria, ever. Not once. Adam Lanza, a geek. Zits. Terrible athlete. Didn't smell good. Clo awkward clothes. Didn't speak well. Nobody talked to him. Nobody ever sat with him at the lunch table. Ever! You got a kid like that in your school? Huh? Every school has a kid like that. Poor Adam Lanza, poor stupid Adam Lanza, you know? Bent, twisted. If one day somebody had sat down with him and endured that kid for half an hour, maybe the world turns and goes in a different direction. You know the story of Bin Laden? Six foot four, 140 pounds, terrible athlete. People laughed at him on the soccer field because he was such a gawk. He was such a geek. Born rich and in sin. More money than he knew what to do with before he was even born. What a trap. What a prison to grow up in, all that money. You know, all you would think about would be money, you know. Fifty-two children his father had. Probably didn't know his name. Divorced his mother before he ever went to school. No father, you know, a geek. The other kids laughed at him. If only, if only. What if, what if somebody was kind to that kid at the right moment? Maybe history turns and goes in a different direction. You know? So you remember, don't remember nothing but fear and massacre on December 14th. Remember the courage, the bony, sinewy, wild, crazy, defiant courage of Dawn and Mary. Because their story is your story, and yours and yours. You are Dawn and Mary, and don't forget it. Don't let anybody take it from you either. If you don't trade stories back and forth that have substance and humor and grace and defiant courage in them, you'll get nothing in your life but lies and sales pitches. And if you accept a life where you listen to other people's lies and sales pitches, shame on you! Because we're a better country than that and you know it. You know, we catch and share stories that matter. You know, a kid said, I was telling a kid this morning, I was in Australia recently and a boy says to me, yeah, what's the great American story? I said, I'll tell you. For once I had the right answer. I'll tell you. January 1, 12.01 a.m., 1863. As of 12.01 a.m. on that day, in 1863, no more selling people in my country. No more going down to the village green and sticking your fingers in a guy's mouth to feel his teeth to see if maybe you should take him home and use him like a horse. 
No more going down to the Village Green and staring at a naked 16-year-old girl thinking you'll buy her. No more. No more going down to the Village Green and buying a baby. No more. Can't do it illegal. You go to jail. Right? And the guy who made that law got his head blown off. And I think he knew he was going to die because he made that law. And he did it anyway because it was the right thing to do. And he stood up and he said, I'm changing the story. Are you with me or not? Let's go. You know? Every one of us is Abraham Lincoln and Flannery O'Connor and Ruth Springsteen and Dawn and Mary and the firemen are in up that day. It's in you, man. That shard of light, of wild courage. Don't let it be quenched by anything. Don't let money quench it. Don't let power quench it. And don't let anybody else quench it. I don't want to care about your politics. I don't care about your religion. I care about who you are. As Mary Oliver says, what are you going to do with your one wild and precious life? You know? I don't care what political creed you believe in. I care that you're an American. You're my teammate. And we're going to invent a new kind of a country that all the other countries go, wow, those people are cool. And not because we're big and strong, because we're the baddest guys on the planet, because we're the most creative and the most inventive and the funniest and the silliest. That's why. Why not us? Why not? You know, what the heck is our country built on except the words, why not? Who's to say no? You know what I mean? So you share Dawn and Mary, right? And then let's end in a weird and beautiful way because we're in this beautiful theater. Sing with me, brothers and sisters, sing with me. My mother's favorite song, my mother 93, my mother's mind is starting to slip away, you know, little by little, an extraordinary cool bony lady, you know, and her favorite song, as she's told us a million times, at my funeral, boys, you will sing Amazing Grace. We're like, oh, ma, will you stop telling us that? So, brothers and sisters, you will sing Amazing Grace with me. We'll only sing the first verse, because nobody knows the rest of the verses. <laughs> Not even the people who invented it know the rest of the verses. <laughs> but you'll sing the first verse with me, and for once, God help me, you will sing like crazy. I don't care that you can't sing baloney. I can't sing. You know, so we're going to sing together, and for once we're going to drop our masks and not be cool, and we're going to sing like hell. Ready? Here we go. Ready? And boom it, or else I'll be yelling at you. Ready? Here we go. Amazing grace. How sweet. The singing in the middle. Sweet Jesus, stand up. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah! Way to embarrass everybody else. <laughs> oh, jeez Louise. Mm -hmm. My friend Tommy, here's one last story. My friend Tommy worked for San Laurel Neal. Right? My friend Tommy, first broker in his first white collar. It was family. Tommy worked for Sandler O'Neill. Sandler O'Neill is run by a classmate of mine from the University of Notre Dame. His name is Jimmy Dunn. Uh, on September 12th, when he found out how many of his people had died, more than 100 of his people were murdered. Murder is the right word. And he said to every, he gathered his people together and said, this company is not going out of business. This company is going to keep going, and I will pay for every single child who lost a mother or a father today, who worked for Sandler O'Neill, I will pay for them to go to college. It turns out there's like 320 kids are gonna to go to college because Jimmy Dunn said, I will be damned if I'll let them not go to college because they don't have a mom or a dad. <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty cool story. You know, you wanna tell, if I could tell stories to Midline, that's be one of them saying, you thought you, thought you scared these people? You're a fool. Screw you, pal. No way. Mm. So, mm. anyway, 
All right, this is a good place to stop. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out and spending some time with us this evening. And I'm sure that you just want to have a little bit more of Brian Doyle. So I hope you'll stop by the table on your way out uh, to check in with our friend Brenda Keen from the Georgia Review, the UGA uh, literary magazine. Brian is featured in a couple of their issues that she has available to you, and it's just a great publication anyway. So um, thanks again for coming out and spending some time with us tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.